welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith TV. I'm Larry Gent and this is the message for Grace Hartwood United Methodist Church on July 25th, 2021. More than enough. The Psalter today is Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and give freely. Their children will be a blessing. The gospel reading is from John 6. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? The sermon text is from 1 Kings 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. For the past couple of weeks, we spent some time visiting our friend Elijah. This week, we go back even further to visit his mentor, Elijah. And once again, we find God's people wrestling with a covenant dispute. It's not mentioned in the text, but it's all over this story. God's people were trying to have their cake and eat it too. They were trying to serve God, but they were also keeping a side bet on Baal. You may be familiar with Einstein's definition of insanity. That is, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, you can see it all over Scripture. Every time God's people turn to Baal, things turned bad. Don't you have to wonder... Why did they keep doing it over and over? To understand, you have to remember that God was the Lord of the covenant, a place where the strong cared for the weak, 
a place where ministry to the poor mattered more than the power of the wealth. But Baal and his goddess friend Ashtaroth, well, they were the gods of fertility. They were the gods of sexy. Now, worship of the fertility cult is not ancient history. If you think the altar of sexy is buried in the dust of time, then you have never watched a commercial. In fact, I'd say that the center of the fertility cult is not ancient Palestine, but modern day America. We use the cult of sexy to sell everything. Cars promise to make you sexy, even Hyundais. I've seen a lot of Hyundais. I've driven Hyundai rental cars. I've even owned a Hyundai. Not once did I sit in a Hyundai and feel sexy. But they want you to believe this year's model is different. And then there's deodorant. The commercials say, without their product, you're a social outcast but rub a little of their deodorant on and bam, you'll be irresistible. And then there's beer. In these ads, everyone who drinks beer is young and fit. They are athletic and popular. This doesn't seem to match the average beer drinker in real life. And let me go on record here. Some people are blessed to be able to use alcohol without ill effect. If you're one of those people, blessed art thou. But here's one thing you've never heard. You've never heard anybody say, my life was difficult. I didn't have any friends. I was adrift, lost and alone. But then I started drinking heavily and suddenly everything got better. Hmm. What was Einstein's definition again? Oh, and my favorite advertisements at the altar of sexy are toothpaste commercials. According to the commercials, all you have to do is dab a little on your brush, look at yourself in the mirror, and suddenly, bing, you'll be sexy. I've tried every brand. I've looked hard into that mirror, and all I ever see is a fat old man with foam in his mouth. And they all agree that's true for every other brand. But if you use our toothpaste, bing! Well, Einstein just shakes his head. But Madison Avenue keeps making these commercials for one reason. They work. Well, they worked in Elijah's day too, but back then Baal had more to do than sell toothpaste. Baal had to supply the rain, the seed of fertility, and if there was no rain, there was no harvest. And if there was no harvest, it didn't mean the prices went up at the supermarket. It meant that people starved to death starting with the poor and the vulnerable, sometimes reaching all, reaching all the way to the rich and powerful. No rain meant no food. Now to really understand this problem, you have to look at Israel from a God's eye view, or at least from a satellite image. If you look down at Palestine, you'll see a nice green area and then abruptly, all the land turns brown. All that lovely green stuff, yeah, that's the land of Baal. And the brown stuff, that's the promised land. The promise wasn't that life would be easy there. The promise was that God would provide. But back in the land of Baal, life was easy. The rains came right on time. The harvest came right on time. Life was easy and everyone was strong and beautiful 
And Israel said, well, we want some of that. And that all went great until the wheels fell off. When the rains didn't come and the crops didn't grow and even the sexy people looked bad, they might have even smelled bad without sexy teeth. Back in Israel, they didn't blame Baal. They didn't blame themselves for messing with Baal. They blamed God for letting them down and they blamed Elijah for not praying hard enough to end the drought. Things got so bad that Elijah had to go hide with the Philistines. And guess what? That land was burning up with drought and famine too. People were starving there too. So let's think about that a minute. America has just been through a 15 month COVID famine and it's not over. It affected the poor and vulnerable first, but the powerful and strong people have all been touched as well. Like Elijah's drought, this has been an international event. And like the people of Elijah's day, our faith in auxiliary backup gods has been shaken. Wasn't science supposed to keep us safe? Wasn't the government supposed to have all the answers? But the true damage of this viral event isn't viral. It's social, psychological, emotional, and spiritual. And those are things only God can heal. Well, it turns out that the real damage of the drought in Elijah's day couldn't be fixed by any second-rate gods. When things got too hot for Elijah in Israel, God told him to take a little vacation. Go on down to the coast, down to the land of Baal. I've told a widow to look after you there. Now a widow in the land of Baal was between a rock and a hard place. There was no social security net. She was the last of the last and the least of the least. Elijah asked her for water, and she complied. Then he asked her for bread. More than that, he asked her to fix him some bread first, and then feed herself and her son. Well, that pushed her just a little too far. You see, she and her son were just about to starve to death. She was gathering sticks at the gate of the city. Not the ideal place to look for firewood, but she was too weak to go any further. Maybe she was gathering up the sticks that fell from other bundles. Maybe she was just breaking dead branches off the bushes. She didn't need much fuel because she didn't have much left to cook. She knew this would be the last meal they would have, and then she and her son would starve to death. But there they were, the widow and the prophet, both of them right at the edge of survival. She had nothing left to share, and he had nothing to offer but empty-handed need. Well, I get it, don't you? We're all kind of running on empty right now. We've survived the pandemic, but we're not thriving. We're running low on energy and just trying to pick up sticks. We'd like to have more to share with the world, but right now all we can do is pick up those sticks and see what's left. The woman in this story didn't have time or energy to look after anybody else, but when he asked, she gave Elijah a cool drink of water. Now, she wasn't feeling particularly faithful. She wasn't even sure she believed in his God. She made a point of telling Elijah that that was his God, not necessarily hers. But he asked for a little generosity, and she gave all she had. Then he asked for a whole lot more. He asked for some kindness and hospitality. Go fix us all some supper, he said, but serve me first. 
Well, the nerve. That's how you treat an honored guest. Elijah wasn't her honored guest. He wasn't even an invited guest. But Elijah said, don't worry. God's got this. Just do it and God will work it out. And you know what she did? She fussed about it. I don't know where you get off, Mr. Prophet Man, but we're starving to death and down to our last meal. And you want me to put you at the head of the table? Who do you think you are? And Elijah didn't take offense, but he said, that's the wrong question. Ask me who I think God is, because I know God is the one who will provide. You don't have to believe you can do it. All you have to do is do it and God will work it out. Here's the thing. If you want to see God working some miracles, go hang out with people who have nothing left but faith. That's where they happen. And the biggest miracle God can create is a simple little thing called generosity, hospitality. It's in the miracle of Jesus feeding the multitudes. The real miracle began when a little boy gave away his lunch. That little boy knew this little gift was more than enough in God's hands. You know, that's the only miracle that's mentioned in all four Gospels. And it all began with sharing the little he had so God could provide more than enough. I wonder, was that little boy happy about giving his lunch to Jesus? Maybe if he was a little boy. Probably not if he was a teen. Definitely not if he was a tween. Cha, as if, okay, boomer, here's my lunch. Well, let's hope he was a little kid with a good attitude. Hey, that would have been a miracle in itself, but it could happen. We've got a few people around here, around our church, who would cheerfully do anything for anybody in need. And we've got a few people who are a little more like the widow in this story, who fuss every step of the way. Sometimes there might even be a little fussing and cussing. But at the end of the day, those people, you people, you, I'm talking to you, you still do what God calls you to do. You still help the ones who can offer nothing in return. You still welcome the least, the last, and the lost. You still show generosity, hospitality to all, and you still make everyone feel like an honored guest. That's where miracles begin. And in God's hands, that's more than enough.